Hello and welcome to the continuing series, Conversation in Risk Management and Corporate Governance. My name is Don Schwartz and I'm the Director of the Center for Integrated Risk Management and Corporate Governance at Loyola University of Chicago. Today I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Frank Strink. Frank is the Senior Vice President, Risk Management Services for the Lockton Company. The Lockton Company is a global risk manager insurance broker. Frank has had a distinguished career spanning nearly 25 years where he has helped companies develop risk management strategies and risk pricing. Frank, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Don. One of the things that you bring is a wealth of experience. As you survey the market today, what is the state of enterprise risk management? Well, it's interesting. I think um, enterprise risk management has evolved over the years uh, from a focus by financial institutions and banks and even the utility companies back in the, uh, in the early 90s. Uh, and the types of risks they were evaluating typically were financial risks uh, for the utilities, trading type risks. And what we're seeing today is an evolution where enterprise risk management is now growing across all business sectors, uh, private companies and public companies, as well as small companies and large companies. So uh, a tremendous expansion across all industries. The focus has become more on operational type risk, uh, strategic risks. Are our business strategies aligned with the way we're operating our company? Uh, from an operational standpoint, uh, things like vendor relationships, partner relationships, uh, as opposed to years ago, it was more, uh, more of a focus on financial risk, quant more quantifiable risks, uh, as opposed to risks today that you, maybe you can't quantify well, but they certainly impact your day-to-day -day business operations. Let's take the idea of vendor risk for just a minute. Well, Specifically, what are some of the things that you've seen in terms of vendor risk? Well, vendor risk for a lot of companies is, is absolutely critical uh, from the standpoint of you know, if I have partnerships with vendors that I'm, I'm sourcing product from, where are they producing their product? Uh, so what, what you bring into play is you bring in geographical risk, you bring in political risk. If my, if my vendors are uh, sourcing product or manufacturing product overseas in China, that open, uh, opens up a wide array of different exposures that the company needs to deal with. So it's not even their exposures, it's the exposures of their business partners. Let me just digress for a minute. Given what's going on in the global marketplace, have you seen an amplification in vendor risk? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I will tell you that's probably one of the top risks that is emerging with many, many organizations today. How about we had an issue of pandemics a few years back, particularly in China. Did that uh, emerge as one of the concerns for your clients? Yeah, and it's very interesting you bring that one up. Uh, years ago, it was the, uh, the avian flu, and today it's the is it H1N1 flu, I believe. Uh, and it's interesting because what we found was it was originally companies in the food business, whether it's food processing or food service, restaurants, were very concerned about the pandemic. Uh, what I found was that companies that had nothing to do with food, the food business we're very concerned about the avian flu from the standpoint of if a, if a flu epidemic breaks out, how do I get my people to work? Will my customers come to my business to do what it is that I do? So it really, it really worked its way through the entire uh, business community uh, from the standpoint of trying to manage the impact of that risk should an event occur. One of the things that you do in your business, I presume, is you work a great deal with senior management and boards. In terms of enterprise risk management, do you think these folks have a realistic idea of what it is and an expectation for what it can accomplish? I think they have an expectation. I don't think they all have an appreciation for what it really is. Uh, and that's part of, that's part of what, what we try and do is part of this, part of ERM or effective ERM within an organization is education. Uh, we spend a fair amount of time educating both senior management and the board, board members, as to what enterprise risk is, how do you implement it within your organization, and what are you going to get out of it? Because uh, there is a cost involved, there's an internal cost, and certainly uh, board of directors, senior management want to know what can we get out of this. So as you go about educating people, can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Because I presume that if you don't educate all the way through the organization, the durability or sustainability of what you're trying to do 
uh, quickly disappears. Very true, and it's, it's, it's interesting because there's education at both ends of an organization. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we find is if senior management, uh, the CEO and the board, does not support enterprise risk within the organization, it will absolutely die very quickly. Uh, you can have a good start to the process, but if that support's not there from a senior management level, it will not sustain itself. Likewise, if the organization itself uh, doesn't sustain it or doesn't embrace it, it will die kind of from the bottom up. And one of the, th one of the ways we, we try and mitigate that is to get some successes, get some quick wins within an organization so that we can expand it out throughout the company. Talk a little bit about quick wins, uh, uh, the so-called low-hanging fruit. Sure, sure. I could, uh, you know, give you an example. Uh, we had a, uh, a a client, a company who was uh, we were evaluating uh, risks for for the organization, and it started out as a very broad enterprise approach. And what we found was there was uh, some very significant technology risks that they that, that they were concerned about throughout their entire operation. And at a given operational level, it wasn't a major exposure, but when you rolled it up to the organization as a whole, it was a huge risk to them that they faced. And uh, we began to focus on that risk, and they, they got some very, very quick hits where we addressed the risk, we were able to put mitigation plans in place, and in fact, uh, eliminated that risk uh, to the organization. You know, it's interesting. You are dealing with so many different kinds of risks, technology risks, reputational risks, logis logistical risks. How do you do that, given your background? How do you confidently address all these different kinds of risks? Well, you know, in, within enterprise risk management, within a company, uh, there are certain risk experts in all of those areas. So my role is really to come in and help the organization establish a process, establish an infrastructure, lead them through that process, but I, I rely on risk experts in those risk domain areas. So for example, technology risk, we'll re, I'll rely on the technology folks within an organization, plus I'll call on my own internal resources that are technology experts. Uh, vendor risk is the same thing. Uh, HR, human resource risk, the same thing. So you've got to bring in the experts to do the deep dives on, on some of those exposures for sure. Let's go back to the process, mm -hmm. and you use this word, how long does it take, and can you kind of walk me through some of the steps? Sure, sure. You know, the steps, it's, it's interesting. One thing I will say is um, if you've seen one enterprise risk management program, you've seen one enterprise risk management program. Uh, no two are alike. Uh, there are certain uh, business processes or ERM processes you can, imp you can impose or you can work with, but they're all very much tailored to the organization because, in a way, enterprise risk is a cultural becomes a cultural thing within the company that we're starting to think about risk in how we operate our business. But we typically start with uh, certainly gaining uh, senior management um, uh, support for the process. Um, we, we start by identifying who the key constituents would be within an organization. And then when we get down into the details, uh, we do a lot of risk brainstorming. Uh, so we'll facilitate uh, half-day meetings where we'll whiteboard uh, the risks that the organization faces. What risks do we have today that are going to impede us from achieving our goals and objectives? What emerging risks are out there that are going to hinder us from getting to where we want to be as an organization? And we'll identify these risks and then go through a process of prioritizing and even measuring. And measuring from the standpoint of how severe is the risk, maybe from uh, impact on asset base or revenue base, What's the likelihood that it'll occur? And is it a risk that's here today or one that we're going to see emanate down the road? So there's a very formal process that, uh, that you can go through to get to that point and then develop risk mitigation plans. Well, let me pick up on a couple things. First of all, how do you manage the different constituencies? Uh, good question. Uh, one, of the, uh, the, the cons one of the issues typically is a, a lot of times the risk constituents might um, feel threatened uh, by an enterprise risk system uh, because these are my risks and I'm managing them well and you know we're doing a great job. And one of the things we need to do is we need to work through that from a culture standpoint and identify how this process is better, 
Uh, there are things that are happening outside of your control that we want to help you manage and get their buy-in. And that's why I said a lot of times we'll, for if there are folks that are a little reluctant to participate in the process, and many times there are, is we'll get to a point where we've gotten some wins, where we've identified some low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. and made some impact, and then those folks typically tend to buy in a little more. Success attracts success, right? Success attracts success. Let me pick up on the other point that you just made, which is the one about measuring exposure and impact. One of the problems I have with ERM is how do I ascribe value to it? And you mentioned assets and revenue. Could you flesh that out a little bit? Sure. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we do is in, in trying to evaluate the risk, clearly you want to know what's the potential impact to the organization. And one way to do that is to try and estimate, is this an impact on, is it going to create a liability on my balance sheet or is it an expense? or is it going to impact revenue or impact my asset base? And what, we've, what we typically do is, is look at the potential impact on scales of 1 to 5 or 1 to 10 and what the, uh, the potential hit would be. And we do that through, um, again, through input from the risk experts. What do you think the impact is on this scaling of 1 to 5 or 1 to 10? Uh, and to the extent we've got, we can gather some data and some information, we can run some statistical models uh, to try and, and better quantify what the impact of those risks are. There's clearly some, I call it uh, qualitative quantification of risk, but to the extent we have some data, we can certainly model it out better and come up with uh, more precise numbers. When I have taught finance, one of the things we look at is scenario analysis. Sure. Do you do a number of scenarios and how do you set them up? We do. We do a lot of scenario analysis and I can give you an example of one that uh, I found very interesting. It was a manufacturing organization and one of the top risks that we identified was uh, their uh, potential loss of a distributor where they distribute their products. One of their major distributors was potentially not going to do business with them anymore. And initially everyone thought this was going to be a huge, huge impact to the organization. What we did, we got a group together uh, within a, a group of folks who dealt with this every day and we, we did exactly what you described. We did scenario analysis. What if this happens? And we laid out diagrams and trees and flow charts and at the end of the day quantified what the real impact of this risk would be based upon those scenario tests. And what we found out, the interesting thing was what we found out was that the loss of that channel, that distribution channel, could actually enhance their revenue because of the ability to develop stronger relationships with the remaining marketplace. It was, it was a very interesting uh, outcome that no one really expected. Wow. When I look at risk, and maybe the finance landscape right now is a good example, I look at li likelihood and magnitude. And one of the problems is no one ever expected some of the events to occur. So how do you balance likelihood and magnitude? Well, what we try and do is, is trying to get overall measurement of risk where you include or you reflect both likelihood and magnitude. And that only goes so far because what many companies do and what we recommend you do, in addition to looking at the overall size of the risk, look at the high severity risks, the black swan events that, um, that aren't going to occur very often, but when they do, it, they are a huge, huge impact. So we certainly suggest and, I, and focus on those total overall risks, but then also focus on the one, even lo low likelihood, but very, very high impact if it occurs. When you talk about high severity risks, how do you even identify some, some of these are such a surprise, both management and the board of directors, how do you do that? Well, you, get, uh, you, you, get, you, you do it through scenario analysis. What if this happens? What's the downstream stream impact to the organization? And when you can't truly quantify it, uh, you can do it on, on a scaling basis. A scale of 1 to 10 is a, t a 10 is going to take us down totally. A 1 is, you know, it's bad, but it's not too bad. And if you get consensus around those values, and if you've tested a lot of scenarios, then the results are valuable and you can, you, you can identify that as a key risk and start, start driving into how you're going to mitigate it or what are you going to do if it happens. There are risks that are going to be totally out of your control, hence 9-11, but planning for the event is sometimes very, very important. All of us are limited in terms of time and ability. 
So effectively, what I hear you're saying is you have to prioritize. And let's go back to how you prioritize. And secondly, how does prioritize conflict with the low-hanging fruit? Sometimes the easiest things are low priority. So how do you balance the two? Well, prioritization of risk is, a, is, a, uh, is an interesting process of how you get there because when you get the risk experts together, a lot of, uh, a lot of times you have conflicts as to uh, what the high priority uh, risks are. Most companies today are looking to mitigate the high impact events. Uh, if there's low-hanging fruit that you could pick off, uh, some companies will identify a different team to address those and have a more sophisticated team address the, uh, the higher impact. So some companies are actually trying to deal with both. Let's get the low-hanging fruit if we can. But if there are risks out there that can be huge impact, uh, there is a big focus on those. So let's take this back. We've been sort of circling <clears throat> around the whole risk management process. So could you kind of structure for me the process and how long it takes to implement so we can just kind of put an exclamation point on sure. what you said? Sure. You know, the process begins with, again, uh, identifying the key constituents of the organization. Um, it, it typically starts with many companies form, uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, an enterprise risk management committee that's made up of many of the senior executives, uh, the CFO, the COO, possibly, head of HR, IT. And these folks are there to help foster the process through the organization. Once we've got that organizational infrastructure established, then we can get into developing the process of how are, we gonna, how are we gonna identify these risks, how are we gonna prioritize them, and how are we gonna manage them going forward. And that's where it starts tailoring a little bit for different organizations. A lot of companies will establish and, and do it through brainstorming activities. A lot of companies, some companies will do it through surveys. But at the end of the day, it's about uh, getting those risks identified. And how long, Don? Uh, I would tell you that uh, it doesn't happen overnight, probably a three to five year process. Okay, now that you've begun the process, it's one thing to start to implement, but how do you evaluate on an ongoing, and how do you fine tune on an ongoing basis? Very good question. Uh, on, on an ongoing basis, um, Maybe an example would help. Uh, I have one client that uh, we helped them establish the infrastructure and helped establish and develop a process that worked for them. And uh, the first year of implementation, we went back on a quarterly basis uh, with their teams to identify and validate the risks that we identified the prior quarter. The second year that they were, uh, they were active, they ran the process themselves internally and validated every quarter. And then every other year, uh, they bring us in to just to make sure that uh, nothing new has come, there's nothing new out there. Maybe there are risks they've not identified that we see from a more global perspective that, uh, that we want to address. Or maybe there's some new processes or techniques that we can bring to bear. Um, Let me step outside. Everything you're describing is sort of management centric. And one of the contentions is, is that the board needs an independent, separate risk assessment. Do you see sort of the possibility of a separate risk reporting, risk measurement identification to the board apart from management? I do. I, I, I see some companies that absolutely have that where the uh, enterprise risk manager or the chief risk officer reports up to the board and reports the, uh, the impact of those risks uh, up to the board. I have one client where the, uh, the, the ERM process is coordinated and managed by the general counsel's office. Wow. Yeah. And uh, they report up, uh, they report the results of this to the board directly. Yeah. You know, you've got financial people, you've got operational people, you've got legal people, you've got supply chain people. How do you put those together again? I, I'm struggling to see how you fit them all into the same ERM, ERM framework? Well, you know, it's, it's companies face risks across all those risk domains that you just described. And There's others. certainly a multitude of a risks. A multitude of risks. And you can try and categorize them. Uh, but at the end of the day, what you have to rely on is that you have risk experts that exist within organizations. They're responsible for managing their particular domain of risks that they're expert in. And in theory, if everyone does that, 
then you've mitigated a lot of risk to the organization. What happens is as, as those risk experts manage risk, it all flows up to looking at the entire risk profile for the entire organization. You have I, 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 IT, technology risk, HR risk, operational risk, and each of the, all of those domain experts manage those risks, and, but then it absolutely rolls up to the organization. Is there a particular case or company that kind of highlights this in your mind and how this whole thing kind of wraps together? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm working with a, a client right now. It's, a, it's an organization. Uh, it's in the healthcare business. It's in the healthcare uh, arena. And um, they've got a myriad of risks from an operational standpoint. They also face a, a, a great deal of risks that are just prevalent because of the, the industry that they're in. And we have absolutely identified their key risk domains, uh, things like clinical affairs within the, uh, the facilities that they operate. Technology risk is huge, huge for them because of uh, some of the HIPAA regulations and the fact that uh, uh, hospital information, patient information must be kept confidential. Um, operational risk from the standpoint of natural disasters. Uh, they're located in an area that's prone to natural disasters, so how do you manage that? And what they've done is they established an enterprise risk working committee, and all of these risk domains, we help them to identify this myriad of risk domains, risk experts within those domains, and have embarked on the process of drilling down into all of those areas and start focusing on those risks. And then we present back to the board uh, an overall risk profile for the organization. It's interesting. We started this whole conversation out talking about financial companies and utilities. Then we threw in food companies. Then we threw in healthcare companies. Is there a thread that crosses all of these kind of uh, different industries? I realize you said every ERM is a separate a ERM. Is there a thread that crosses all of these? Yeah, there is a thread, and, and the thread is, and, and I'll quote or try and quote a CEO that I, I was with not too long ago. It's a company that uh, has embarked on ERM, and he said, you know, if I think about what you're telling me about enterprise risk, it's nothing more than good, sound business practices. Understand my risks and understand how I manage them going forward. And Good risk management, superior risk management, uh, you can gain operational efficiencies within an organization. And we see companies that actually gain a competitive advantage by managing risk better than their competitors. You know, I think back, my first employer, while it was a commodity-based company, mm -hmm. its real strength was in risk management, whether it was managing operational risk, credit risk, logistical risk, financial risk, and Really, it's interesting that you highlight that risk management is a potential competitive advantage. Absolutely. We see it, uh, we see it a lot. We see how companies are starting to leverage, uh, leverage risk management in that way. Now, it's not easily done. And I said earlier, you know, it's typically a three to five year process. Companies that really do it well, it's probably on the tail end of that three to five year process. It's when companies get really, really good at managing risk effectively. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground. Let's take your crystal ball out for just a minute. Okay. And let's look into the future. First of all, do you see anything going on right now, whether, whether it's regulatory, operational, financial, that might have a significant impact on the future of risk management? And secondly, what do you see going forward, some of the real concerns for non-financial companies in terms of risk management? Yeah, the, uh, one of the things that we've, uh, we're seeing is the uh, SEC has come out with uh, some guidelines. They're actually out for commentary, and I think companies' commentary are due in mid-September. But what they're, what they're looking to do is to have more disclosure uh, in two particular areas. The first is around a company's compensation policies, and are those compensation policies aligned with the long-term objectives of the company? Or, and or, do those compensation policies encourage risk-taking that's not aligned with the long-term sustainability of the organization? And then the second part of, uh, of what the SEC is looking at is 
disclosing more about the board's knowledge of the board's activity with respect to risk management. So that's again, that's uh, that's in the proposal state, but I think it uh, it will certainly add more uh, disclosure type necessity to many companies. Would you speak for a minute about what is the proper role of the board in risk management? Yeah, I think the I think it's uh, it's it's primarily uh, oversight. I think they. The board's primary role is to make sure that, that the company has a viable, a strong risk management process in place, that it's, it's done on an on a ongoing basis. It's not a project that's done once, results put on the shelf, never to be seen again. It's an ongoing process, and the board receives reports and updates as to how things are going with respect to risk. And our, you know, are our business goals and objectives, have we identified the risks of achieving our business goals and objectives? Is it reasonable to expect that a board will even have this expertise? No. And if not, how do they get it? Well, I, I would tell you no, it's, it's not because obviously boards uh, are, very, very, are very diverse. But, you know, one of the things um, that uh, certainly going back to regulatory, the regulatory side, S&P, uh, ah. is looking at evaluating enterprise risk programs for or all organizations. They started with financial institutions and the, uh, some of the utilities, but now it's all organizations. And one of the things that they've, uh, they've said is the boards need to be educated. Uh, and whether that's senior management educating them or outside folks coming in, and, but the boards need to understand more about risk. And I think what the SEC is saying in their, in their proposal is, yeah, they do, and we want to make sure that the boards do understand what's going on from a risk management perspective. Actually, you anticipated my next question was, what qualifies rating agencies to assess non-financial risk? When I'm not looking at the balance sheet or my leverage, et cetera, et cetera, what qualifies them? And secondly, how can you make an objective evaluation and assign a letter grade to that as a rating agency? The rating agencies, I, I think they would acknowledge that they are not risk management experts necessarily, but they, do, they have recognized that effective risk management goes a long way towards uh, ensuring the long-term viability of an organization. And they're going through some internal education as well. Part of what they're doing is I think they're still collecting information so that they can start doing some industry benchmarking across different industries to begin to set those, uh, those scalings or those ratings. I, I, they're still in that process. So as we wrap things up, let's go back to your crystal ball and mm -hmm. talk about what do you think the future of risk management is and what are some of the risks that you think will become more prevalent as we come to the, the 2010 period? Well, I think we've. Uh, I, I think from a risk management perspective, I think enterprise risk, um, broad risk management, focused risk management at organizations is here to stay. Uh, it's it's not about regulation anymore. It's about managing your business effectively. So I think we're going to see that continuing on. As far as risks and exposures goes, I will tell you the top risks today. I would identify as uh, data privacy is a huge, huge exposure to a lot of companies and they're very concerned about it. Reputational risk cuts across a lot of different operational areas. It's a huge, huge uh, concern of a lot of companies, uh, is, is, is certainly how their reputation is perceived in the marketplace. Uh, you mentioned pandemic. Companies are very, very worried about that for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Can I get my employees here and will my customers continue to buy my product uh, if there's a pandemic? I think more recently, every, everyone's concerned about the economy, the credit situation uh, is kind of there because of the, uh, the, the state of the economy that we're in today. Uh, the other one I will say is uh, political risk. Um, I'll, again, I'll go back to my vendor example. A lot of companies uh, today source product coming in from China and, and, and Asia and, and other places overseas. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of political risk associated with that. And companies are very concerned about that. You know, one of the things that I've taught when I've taught international business is the idea of this like a web of suppliers located around the world. In terms of a risk, do you think there will be a change in that model, going back to a more simple, you know, geographically close uh, supplier network? You know, it's, it's going to be a matter of, of uh, cost, I think. You know, there's companies today are under a lot of pressure to cut costs, and it's 
may be more financially efficient to source those products overseas. But I think as companies start recognizing the risks associated with that, uh, they will start pulling back a little bit and making sure they can manage. It's kind of a balancing of there's a cost, but there's also a risk and an exposure uh, involved. In an environment that is so cost conscious, are companies really focus sufficiently on risk today? Do they really appreciate the cost of risk? I think they do, and, I, and the reason I say that is because of the economy we're in and a lot of cost cutting, there are a lot of companies embarking on enterprise risk activities today. And I think the, I think the reason is that they, they perceive that there's value in, in gaining operational efficiencies and stemming off the big issues that could hit them and really take them down. Oh, super. We've covered a very wide area, and I'd like to thank you, and we're so pleased to have you here today. Thank you, Don. It's a pleasure.